We are a growing group of independent researchers working towards definitive proof and protection of the species commonly referred to as Bigfoot. In 2005, our initial group consisted of a cooperation of four people, a biologist from Great Falls, Montana, a Cree Nations elder representing the First Nations people, the skeptic Todd Standing, and a paramedic firefighter from Calgary, Alberta. After Todd went public with our work, enthusiasts, scientists, and wilderness experts from around the globe began to collaborate with the Sylvanic team. Now we collaborate with scientists from as far away as China and half a dozen forestry and wildlife officers in Canada and the United States. Our tremendous success has come about from our enormous collaboration of minds, experiences, knowledge, and wisdom from all walks of life. Prime mythology meets First Nations experience. Anthropology combined with the greatest still hunting techniques on the planet. These experiences have been passed down through tens of thousands of years of First Nations oral history and tradition with decades of scientific study. Our ultimate goal is to epically introduce civilization to the most man-like primate on the planet. For the past 10 years, I've been conducting expeditions, documenting chronicles, and interviewing people pertaining to the subject of Sasquatch. With over 20 years worth of hardcore backcountry expedition experience into the most remote regions, I've tracked and studied various North American species that have had little to no exposure to civilization. I am a student of many disciplines, trained in the art of tracking by a Cree Nations elder and a military sniper. My skill sets include camouflage techniques using the terrain and its features to mask ground movement, obstacle crossing, camping positions, effective observation, camouflage penetration, counter surveillance, survival evasion, and escape techniques. In 2006, my team and I publicly showed two separate crystal clear Bigfoot videos I personally filmed, which we used to petition the Canadian government for species protection of Bigfoot. The petition was certified and tabled in the Canadian House of Commons. The media response was enormous, with hundreds of newspaper, television networks, radio stations, and websites that receptively presented our work across the globe. It was our goal to reach out to the masses about why our group was beginning the struggle for species recognition and protection. Do you believe in miracles? Would you believe me if I told you there was a small mammal that flew around at night completely blind and to survive, it had to consume thousands of mosquitoes every night? Sounds impossible? How about a small-brained aquatic mammal that spent its whole life building intricate aquatic structures while surviving on wood? You probably would think, oh, that's impossible, except you know that bats and beavers are a real, living, thriving species, one of many that currently reside here in the forests of North America. Now I'd like to tell you about another miracle primate species. In fact, the most man-like primate species on the planet. I'm not a believer in this species. I've spent the last decade of my life devoted to researching this species because I, in fact, make no bones about it. They are a real species. I know they exist. I know they have a living, breathing, thriving population here in the forests of North America. And we're gonna explore the reality of this species in this documentary. In the winter of 2012, after five days and four nights pursuing a group of Sasquatch in temperatures dropping below minus 20, I was able to film an altercation between myself and three other Sasquatch. Back in the spot where I filmed video six, uh, just this past winter and uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll sort of walk around and uh, the perspectives are gonna be all off because it was about two feet of snow here all these uh, plants that are about two and a half three feet tall were covered entirely so even possibly three feet of snow was here and behind me to my right is a brand new tree break 
Now this is where it all started. There were, I was sleeping here and they were up what is about 10 yards above me. So I was sleeping in this spot approximately, somewhere around here. And when I woke up, I looked up and there were three of them standing above me. So from this position, I reached for my camera. As soon as I did that, one kicked snow at me and the other two took off. And up there is the main trail. So one went this way. So when I went back up there, I saw his tracks and I knew that this direction was back to that gorge. So this is where I started to follow and the track started over here and I just followed them all the way in. It's minus 15, there's about three feet of snow and I just had a confrontation with three different Sasquatch, one of the Sasquatch of which has taken off into an area that I'm following right now. I'm following this trackway, I'm dog tracking it as I call it. I'm about 15 yards away from it. You never follow the track of a wild animal, especially when it's this fresh. So the whole backstory about what's transpired, this is four days worth of work coming to a culmination right here and now. A whole bunch of things are about to happen. Uh, first of all, we're walking up on a Sasquatch. There's a trackway again that you can see I'm zooming in on. I've got a night light or an infrared light. That's, that's the only reason my camera can see anything right now. It's pitch black and I'm about to walk up on a Sasquatch that you can see right now in the middle of the screen. But more importantly, you're going to hear another Sasquatch make itself well known to me off to the right, right now. Now that I know I have a Sasquatch that's getting, that's protesting off to my right, I know I have to keep moving forward and following this trackway. At this point, I'm starting to make something out directly in front of me. Again, now I can hear a Sasquatch moving up on me to my right, just stepping in the snow. However, I'm focused on that directly in front of me. Clearly a back and an arm are pointed back towards me and this creature has no idea that I can see it right now. The reason I know it's there is I've seen the trackway and that is standing out to me like a sore thumb. There's tracks, there's some very large, enormous object. So I'm going to proceed forward as I always do. So I'm getting a little nervous right now. I'm concerned about making sure I have my focus. This is a wild animal I'm approaching hundreds of miles from the nearest human being, hundreds of miles from the nearest town, out in the middle of nowhere, all by myself. That's a Sasquatch. I'm trying to get my focus. My equipment has been out in minus 20 for four days, cold, two feet of snow, three feet of snow, and this is what happens. Don't blink. That's an 80 pound log that just took me out. From the third Sasquatch, I had no idea was there that was off to my left. There were three of them. They stood together. This is what happens. Now, this is about an hour later. That exact same spot. I am 230 pounds. I'm six foot five with those boots on. I'm going to stand in that exact spot. Now that you can see it's completely vacant. I'm standing there in the trackway and when I jump or put my arms in the air, my hands straight up in the air are about eight foot six, which are still not reaching the height of the Sasquatch that had just been previously standing there. So very clearly an empty space now. This is only less than an hour after the whole incident transpired. Again, there's the creature, clearly enormous. I'm 230 pounds and I look like a little nothing compared to that giant that's standing there, over eight foot six tall, probably in excess of 800 to 900 pounds, standing there less than 20 yards away from me. Once again, here I am standing right again where the spot is totally vacant. I can clearly see Bigfoot tracks there. And that's how large the animal was. Well, what's interesting now that I see is there's a bit of a trail here that probably existed. I just couldn't see it in the winter time, but he used it because the trees are separated in the trail, obviously where he can walk through a little easier. And this is the gorge area. And the reason I was approaching him and following him 
is he wasn't trapped most assuredly but he was gonna have to go up a really steep hill or climb up some rocks and I wanted to see that I expected he would come this way this is the direction he was going but he didn't he stopped and expected me to possibly not see him fortunately for me I had my night vision without it I never would have noticed him there makes the whole situation very interesting having come back here and looking at the fact that the log that was thrown at me is gone a tree break has been made in the right direction and there's a trail here that he knew about in the winter time that he was following and I had no idea perhaps even illustrates how thoroughly experienced they are in their own areas to know exactly where a trail is when it's covered in snow so he was likely here for the log was gonna cross didn't happen because I was approaching however he was not concerned because he had backup from two different directions one that was growling at me and the other that was stealthily waiting in the back for me to keep coming forward until it was too close like he did and then drop me with that log that was thrown at me for every time I've filmed them I've seen them five for every time I've seen them I've been aware of their presence 20 times there are millions of people that believe in the possibility of this species, hundreds of thousands that believe, but very few that know they are real. The circumstantial evidence is overwhelming with tracks that display dermal ridges analyzed by the best fingerprint experts in the world who conclude the track evidence is unhoaxable, and eyewitness testimony from the most credible witnesses from doctors to lawyers to a president of the United States. Any court of law requires the evidence of proof be beyond a reasonable doubt. Obviously, we've more than achieved that. However, for a discovery of this magnitude, science will not recognize the existence of this species without a specimen. No amount of circumstantial evidence will do. Part of the answer to the question is technology has driven mankind away from nature and by extension driven us further away from the ultimate apex species in nature, which is Sasquatch. My team and I have broken off an area we are certain this species of hominid currently survive within. We refer to this area as the Bigfoot North region. This region is larger than the entire continental United States and has a human population of approximately 15 million people, urban and rural. Over 80% of this region currently has no sustainable human presence. Now let's estimate the population of Sasquatch to be 15,000 individuals, a number I'm certain even the most hardened believer would say is overly generous. 15,000 of them take up 80% of the terrain, and 15 million of us take up 20% of the terrain. We as masters of civilization are loud and obvious in everything we do. We thrive on manipulating our environment to suit our needs. These hominids are masters of the wilderness. They thrive on living in harmony and equilibrium within their environment. Just as they thrive on nature and their natural abilities, we thrive on technology. However, there is no other living primate species we share more traits with. Currently, they are the most man-like species on the planet. Each of us simply having evolved either towards technology or nature to the extreme. Both of our species having used intelligence to advance our position in the complex networking of this planet. This whole idea, has the Sasquatch in fact been discovered? See, my, my, my thinking is that every person who sees a Sasquatch discovers it for himself or for herself. But that's usually as far as it goes. Once he or she tries to talk about it, there's ridicule and rebuttal and discomfort. One of the things that keeps me going is that, you know, we're in this situation where people are, they're not pushing away uh, Sasquatch knowledge, but they're, they're not terribly receptive to it either. And then we're finally going to have this acknowledgement of the discovery. And then people are going to ask, gee, where was the scientific discussion leading up to it? Where was the dialogue? Where were the scientific papers pointing in this direction? And I guess that's what some of us have been trying to do. Todd Standing has produced films that have been largely ignored, and I've written books that have been largely ignored, and I've been unable to get uh, evidence presented at scientific conferences. And there's just been this scientific resistance to the whole idea of the, of the Sasquatch as an existing North American mammal. And I guess that's what we're about, is trying to change that. We blanket ourselves in technology, and they blanket themselves in nature. From every bent blade of grass to the most subtle bird movement, this provides them with information about their environment. 
about the movements transpiring past, current, and future. Each day, the information is provided to them by the wind, sun, trees, and all species that reside in the forest. They are born and raised in the wilderness and live and die under the laws of the natural world, which is survival of the fittest. Since my team and I went public with our information in 2006, I've always said, don't take my word for it. Come out with me in the field and I will show you the reality of this species. And since then, I've taken out dozens of wildlife officers, PhDs and the like, and had them live interact with Sasquatch on multiple occasions. Of course, you can assume alone in the wilderness, I get the best results interacting with Sasquatch I've personally habituated. Here's an example of what's happened to me on dozens of occasions over the last decade of my research. <laughs> some pretty sick action last night. I'll go through my camera setup and what's what's happening right now. So this is my one camera. I'm gonna have to close this lid because this light is bright. It's pitch black right now. I can't really see anything. This is my battery pack that I left here from last time. There's my light. I, I cut this piece of wood so my light would stay on it, but in the commotion last night, I, uh, I knocked it over and I couldn't get it back on, so I'm having enough trouble with this piece as it is. This infrared light is in invisible, and I can't really see where I'm going. I don't want to step on the light. I'm just gonna, there's my battery pack and my knife. I'm just gonna walk around this if I can. It's funny, I, I can't see. <laughs> Unless I look through the camera, I don't know what I'm... It's pitch black right now. I mean, this is a... I'll turn off my infrared filter for a second. This is without the infrared filter. This is with... Here's my camera on my camera bag. See, there's the night vision on it. That specialized night vision. I just have it taped to the camera. And again, there's the, the, the hood that I'll flip back in. I'm expecting a pretty decent night. Since they since they came out last night. So I'm gonna just try not to break my neck here. It's funny, I'm gonna get lost going 20 yards. So there's the apples. So I've got three apples up there. And actually there's a bag right there. Um, anyways, those are the apples. They're approaching from up there in the mountain. I'm freaking tired and I'm not thinking well. I'm just completely exhausted. I feel totally, entirely, pathetically weak. And uh, oh my God, last night was crazy. There are at least two Sasquatch moving towards the apples. I make the mistake of moving towards these two creatures, which ultimately pushes them away. travel into this uninhabited region following animal game trails. Here I was continuously able to generate significant success with at least two individuals I have eyewitnessed on multiple occasions. Um, so we'll see what happens. They, you know, they take apples from me and it's just me out here. Uh, two days ago I did some stuff that's probably really going to piss them off. Not piss them off. Too, well, I obviously didn't piss them off too much. If I pissed them off too much, I'll tell you something. I wouldn't be here right now. If they want to be gone, I'd be gone. I think I just upset them. They come. They came and scared me a little bit yesterday. Um, but I did leave apples for them up on the other side of the mountain. I, I know they took them. They always do. Um, I'll go back there. The apples will be gone. Big shocker. 
but it's it's about getting these apples taken do you think they'll come within 20 yards of me 50 yards of me 100 yards of me i'll have to wait and see so take a step by step i can barely see them but i hear them coming there's two <laughs> big guy. Apples. It's Todd. Okay, like I said. <laughs> wow. There's one here. And I can hear one over here. No doubt about it. And he's 20 yards from the apples. I'm gonna back off a little bit here. Easy, big fella. Hey. I'm just giving him some space because if he goes there, I'll... first two individuals have approached from the eastern side of the mountain. However, unknown to me, the large 800 plus pound dominant male of the group has moved in from the west. The interactions between myself and the two younger individuals has been very productive. Unfortunately, I've never been able to say the same when the big male comes around. He is always profoundly aggressive. For obvious reasons, all my attention becomes focused on him. Wait a second, did you see that? In case you missed it, let's go back and have a closer look. Can you see those three apples way off in the background? Here's a shot of them as they were a few minutes ago. They are three large red delicious apples. Here's what they look like from the other camera 25 yards away. Let's call them apples one, two, and three. Watch again now closely in slow motion to apple number three. Did you see that? Have a closer look. Where Apple 3 once was is now a black, empty space. If you watch it again in slow motion, you can actually see it removed. Now watch this. At this moment, I have no idea those apples are being taken. One, two, and over here. I can hear this guy moving over on me too. And there goes apple number one. Kind of don't know which way to look. I've got nowhere to go right now. Shit.
bloody ninjas. He could be... He could be 20 meters away from me. Or he could be gone. This is the kind of stuff when you get your ass out here and you experience it. I don't give a shit who you are. You'll believe in Sasquatch when you see something like this going on when you're out in the middle of nowhere and this shit starts happening. You'll feel the fear. What you just witnessed was normal behavior for these hominids. They move together as a cooperation in a highly organized fashion, using advanced strategic positions at all times. They are significantly more active at night. During the day, day watchers are out at specific high ground points to ensure the main group sleeps in safety. The Sasquatch are the best trackers, ultimate survivors, and the apex species of their environment. They have all the advantages that has allowed human beings to become the dominant species on this planet, with very few of our detriments. They are twice the size of a gorilla and likely twice as strong, while still having the body composition and the hair to survive in the coldest winters without fire. While living in small yet widely dispersed groups that raise and teach their offspring, each of these groups' survival secrets are specific to their particular environment, having learned over countless generations that have evolved to enjoy abundance in that particular ecosystem. However, the fact that these hominids are hunters is tremendously significant. Hunters track, employ stealth, and must learn everything about their environment to remain successful because a hunter's quarry does all it can to stay alive. They will use every means at their disposal to survive. To hunt successfully, a predator must outwit its prey continuously or perish. Prey that have evolved sensory perceptions hundreds of times superior to humans. These skills the Sasquatch learn and practice every day of their lives allows them to easily evade the most experienced human hunters and trackers. This year, it's time to take it up to the next level. We're going out with the best in the world. Here in this research site, I'm taking out two world-renowned PhDs, a professor from Idaho State University and a PhD wildlife biologist, alone, one-on-one -on -one with me in the wilderness in some of the most wild habitat North America has to offer. Will I be able to convince them that this research is authentic, that those videos that all the sounds, that all the things that I've been claiming are absolutely authentic? The only question left is, will I be able to convince them too? Dr. Jeff Meldrum is a full professor of anatomy and anthropology at Idaho State University. He's been interviewed regarding the subject of Sasquatch on hundreds of occasions. The professor is an expert on foot morphology and locomotion in primates. The Sasquatch are so exceptionally intelligent and well adapted to their environment, few people ever experience a sighting. After over 15 years of researching the subject, the professor has never before live interacted with or witnessed a Sasquatch. My name is uh, Jeff Meldrum. I'm a professor of anatomy and anthropology at Idaho State University in Pocatello, Idaho. Right now, I'm uh, with Todd Standing at the uh, Nordic study site. What we're seeing and what we're noting right now is just the, the significance of game trails. This is a game trail. This is a game trail. We're not saying it's, it's, it's Bigfoot, but uh, it's a hot spot for for species. So when you have deer and elk and this this ecosystem is so significant because as the professor has seen, we've seen signs of bear, we've seen signs of wolves, which is very spectacular. And obviously the elk and the deer and the moose that we've seen, all just tracks, because we're not looking for those species, because this is a habituation site where we're trying to attract the Bigfoot, not chase them around. But when you get a site, when you get an ecosystem so successful like this, obviously we're gonna assume there's mountain lions out here. 
And uh, so this is a top to bottom, really, really successful, modern ecosystem. And you're seeing, as I've even seen you pick up and eat some of the, the berries, what do you call them? I think they're snowberries. Snowberries, the okay. Uh, the name. I've been, That's what comes to mind, but... Uh, I've been taught that they were bunch berries. These little berries are everywhere. Um, right now we're not seeing much of the raspberries and the strawberries. The Saskatoon berries are actually here. I'll show you them, Professor. So these are the, the berries that we're seeing in the scat of the bears, yeah. but they're not ripe anymore. What's a little concerning, I guess, for our purposes here, is there's a, there's a good one that was just uh, dried up. What's a little concerning is the bears were feeding off of this. This was, this is their scat, wow. entirely made up of it. In fact, if you just take a second here and I'll open it, those little seeds, that, see those seeds? Yeah. That's what you saw in, exactly. the, in the bear scat. So they were pretty much consuming 90% of what was in their scat were those berries. Yeah. Those berries are gone. They are no longer uh, a viable food source at yeah. this time. Yeah and it's hibernation mode, and they're going to be after a significant amount of calories. So we are going to keep our campsite super, super clean. Because <laughs> the grizzly bears out here are very arrogant because you're not allowed to hunt them, and they know it. They're not afraid of people. They'll be arrogant and walk right up on you. I was invited to come and evaluate some of the evidence that's associated with the uh, very fascinating videos that, um, that Todd has taken, allegedly of, uh, of Sasquatch here. So how many of these tree breaks have we seen? Uh, at least uh, three. This would be the third, at least. Okay. Are they all in the same direction? They seem to be all yeah. in the same prevailing direction, yeah. Well, come, let's come have a close look at this. <coughs> See if you can try to uh, explain it just by wind. Well, I mean, obviously, uh, trees do topple yep. under natural conditions as they age. The amount of... Uh, of growth of uh, the black tree lichen here suggests that this tree has been standing dead for quite some time. Like, like, like other ones around Like it. the other ones around it, yeah. yeah. So that kind of begs the question too, why, is, why are they breaking you know, at, at points so high from the ground? If it is wind, why didn't these just snap? I'd have a hard time obviously pushing this over right now. And there are other trees around it that are even more dead. If you look to this tree over here. Yeah, here and this one here. About the same thickness and there's no damage to them whatsoever. Do you mind if I try nope. to? Not at all, please do. Try to break it. Yeah, well, that's, well, yeah, yeah. Break it. I, I was just gonna see if it would break at a particular point. Oh, no, see, that's what I would have expected. Agreed. So breaking down near the base. So how would a tree break at a midpoint like that? It just doesn't seem odd to see that over and over. You might think that maybe one or two or some, uh, you know, more, uh, uh, a higher number close by. Why just this one? Mm -hmm. in, as far as we can see, it's just this one. And I guess you could argue as well, this one was ready to be blown over and the others weren't. Hmm. Um, in an area with so little wind though. <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah, that's the other factor. This, this area seems to rather consistently have very little wind, very calm, still. Let, let me ask you this. Okay, I'm, I'm coming from the perspective that I've seen these uh, hominids break trees and do this. And I've seen, uh, I'd say there's about eight or nine of these around. If we took a real good look around, with eight or nine, I think actually more like 10. Yeah. But let's say this was broken by a large hominid. Yeah. What kind of power do you think I mean, first of all, that the height of that is right. That's well, yeah. Obviously, it's going to have to grab above that point of breaking, mm -hmm. and so it's certainly. I'm six foot, so it certainly is at least two feet taller than me. Whatever mm -hmm. it was, if, yeah. if it broke it, if something yeah. like that broke it. And now, so, and now, do you think you would have the power, like on the tree beside it, that's approximately the same thickness? Right. Well, again, how if, powerful do you think you'd have to be to break to hold that tree and? cause a break at that kind of, even at your height. Yeah. Well, it, it all depends again on, on, on the brittleness of the tree and the, the leverage. I mean, mm -hmm. the reason 
the reason this broke clear down here is because my force had to be amplified through that much distance to reach a point that that uh, this would uh, this would collapse this would uh, agree you know, a critical fracture yeah. so it it is very likely that to get a break like that it was probably grabbed you know up maybe even up this high mm -hmm. in order to snap it at that particular point i mean unless you had a two-handed where you're able to uh, concentrate the bending at a midpoint between the two points of, of mm -hmm. applied force. And that's that's how I would, uh, and that's, that's how yeah. I've seen them do it. Okay. It's two hands. Yeah. It's it's purposely in a direction. And even even when I've experimented with these brakes, it's hard to break it that well and not snap it. It, it causes, you have to actually have a degree of where you grab it and break it slowly oh, and then to, it snaps. to so maintain it part of it from, yeah, that's keep right. from snapping completely free. Mm -hmm. In this case, it's split up quite high and so you're going to have a, you know, a, a different looking break. The ones that we've seen have a, a very horizontal break. There's a few little trailers here yeah. um, uh, of uh, you know, just a couple inches in length. This is about six or eight inches. Put right down. All the way down. So it did, it stayed attached. It stayed attached more or less. But that looks very different, obviously, than, Tremendously different, than yeah. this one up here. And I, I get, that's something significant because I've never seen, they always look just like that. Right. Well, and see, we're back. We're to the point where, again, in in this conversation, there's we're, we're coming at it from from two different perspectives. Mm -hmm. You've you claim to have witnessed mm -hmm. the uh, the causal agent of mm -hmm. these breaks. Yes. Yeah. And so it, it yes, it's in the mix, but you have to. But but you know, this may have less weight mm -hmm. than a, a rather suggestive imprint in the in the muskeg that, that suggests a large plantigrade foot, mm -hmm. which has more weight in my mind than just finding a, a, a break like this. Mm -hmm. I have to play as devil's advocate because uh, in sure. all my experience out here, I never see this, never have I seen this in non-Bigfoot habitat. I have never seen a tree all on its own like this, broken with multiple other trees showing zero damage in any way, shape or form. and multiple breaks in the same direction from it's just getting to the point where uh i mean since i since i know that there are bigfoot out here and i love the fact that the phds are so there's so much at stake for them because they have a reputation that they've worked so hard for so many years and they will refuse a good phd that i want will refuse to sit back and, and be too easy about things they have to be skeptical because they have a reputation at stake and now we need to proceed definitively with the next step in a discovery of this magnitude, which is absolutely enormous. A relic hominid alive in North America is such a incredibly, almost impossible miracle to believe that I understand people's skepticism and it's gonna be a lot of hard work from very credible people like Dr. Meldrum and like Dr. Benernagel to come forward and help us out with this. It's essential that we have them and that's why he's here and let's continue. Investigating some uh, possible sign of Sasquatch. Excellent, let's go have a look at this tree structure. Okay. Here's another view of this incredible structure. This is unreal. If I put a little pear on it, as you can see, it is so freaking amazing. Wow, what do you say? That's just crazy. These top three trees have clearly been pushed over since their bases are still firm. No wind or snow load could have done this. The power it would have taken to bend tree four, which has a five inch diameter, is greater than any human being possesses. To push over trees three and five would require twice the strength of even a silverback gorilla. Now you'll notice tree one in this structure is upside down. The base is broken clean and then placed up. The center or fulcrum of this tree is here. Towards your right, which is the top of the tree, is where the majority of the weight resides. If this tree was not shoved into place by a Sasquatch, I have no explanation of how this could happen naturally. And then we have my favorite tree tree number two of the five. This piece right here 
I mean, that's, that's dangling in midair. That did not fall by chance. That was done and that is just huge. Like that structure where the trees all cross, that's uh, 12 feet up from the ground. It's just huge. I'm so impressed with this structure. Most impressive I've ever seen. Gotta take a picture. Yeah, that one's rooted as well. Agreed. So, you know, the only thing I'm concerned about is- They're not all rooted though. You haven't seen them all yet. In, uh, around? Yeah. That there's, one isn't? There's, let's go have a look at that one. Well, that one's tipped clear over the other way. Yes. That, that one's awful low. I'd have a hard time rationalizing rationalizing this one here because the base is so high up. How did it end up clear up like that? And there's one more on that side over there that you haven't gone and looked at that's okay. in the structure. So this one here. Let's see. Well, not immediately apparent if that were the case. So, yeah, so those two there's a possibility that they were stuck up there. The fact that, uh, I mean, I'm not comfortable in, in concluding definitively that this was made by a Sasquatch yet, but the Agreed. fact that there isn't a, an associated base. Give this for a second. Yeah, so there's two elements that I couldn't, I couldn't immediately rationalize as, as having been mm -hmm. just blow down, fall over, so. So yeah, the, the door of possibility is still open to me. Pretty interesting. In Excellent. On seven occasions, apples have been taken from this particular structure. On three occasions, Sasquatch tracks have been found in association with the missing apples. On all three of those nights, we've experienced significant live interactions with them at base camp. Now, Doctor, let's get you to have a look over here at this track we found about two weeks ago, discovered again after apples had been taken. Just walk straight in and try not to step on something that might be a blatant track. So here's our track. It's actually disturbed. Looks like it's only been slightly disturbed. So if we could get our esteemed doctor over here, please. And if you'd look right here. We blocked it off ourselves okay. with the hopes that nobody would come through. So this shouldn't be like that. Well, that, uh, that does have potential as a footprint. Yeah, I mean, I, if pressed, I'd say there's better than a 50-50 chance at least that that's a, that's a Sasquatch track. Mm -hmm. So I guess we're gonna call this uh, day two. I'm with uh, Dr. Meldrum. Um, the night uh, we stayed up till 12.30 and uh, nothing happened. Just absolutely nothing, no, no discernible sounds, nothing of any significance whatsoever. And uh, we are walking right now to, <clears throat> uh, I guess structure number two. And we're going to put up some apples. I'm gonna have him put up some apples with me and we'll leave them there and see what happens. Actually, I would also like to, uh, since we have a little bit of time, uh, he and I are going to scour the area for about a half an hour to see if we can find any tracks or anything significant here because I put apples up here last week and they're all gone. So, and nobody should have been over here. I haven't touched the area at all since I was here last week. So we'll have a look and see what's there. I've seen some interesting uh, so-called tree structures, trees that uh, that take on a sort of a teepee appearance uh, that um, the Todd is convinced uh, represent um, a boundary marker or some sort of effort to communicate the presence of, uh, of Sasquatch in this particular region. Another thing I do love about these structures too is they're generally like this where you know you can see I don't have any nails. Look at what, look at the damage I just did to that. If I was a bear and I put my claws on this, you'd see tremendous marks. And there's really zero indication. And with me having been out here and had five successful uh, gifts taken, there's just no indication of any bears of, of any kind. 
So putting apples on it is my way of saying, I know you guys are here. I'm here for you. Here's a gift. I think that's just a, a basic little simple communication I can do. So mm -hmm. anyways, well, let's have a look around here and see what we can see. There's a really, there's a really significant impression right there. Wow, you can really see that. That's a beautiful impression. This is the furthest back I've been. So that's not from us. Yeah. Yeah. There were some indications of what appeared to be uh, you know, a, a large plantigrade foot. And that's just a smaller track. Is that you too? Yeah. yeah, just a second ago, yeah. Okay. So that's uh, a little bit older. I assume this is an individual I've eyewitnessed on two other occasions. I identify him as a bulky individual, dark brown, under seven feet tall. I'd love to hear your perspective on it. Okay. Well, well yeah, I, I would concur with what you're, what you're saying. I mean, it, uh, it really has broken the muskeg there. And uh, there's certainly a, a taper back here for a heel and, and a broad forefoot, potentially. And it had the shape and proportions of a, of a 13 inch footprint, was pressed extremely um, heavily down to the ground. It suggested a, a something of considerable weight. So this could be as old as two months ago, right? Yeah. That's uh, the best track I've seen over here. Flatly, and the front uh, end was torn, uh, perhaps by the action of toes um, of something walking um, in the vicinity of this uh, of this structure. So now that we've documented this track, and I'm pretty much done with it, I'd like you to pick a spot right beside here, and I'd like you to step as hard as you can. Let's see what kind of see what kind of imprint you can make beside it. So let's come back and have a look. <clears throat> This is, uh, this is Dr. Meldrum's track. He's about uh, 220 pounds, probably 240 with all his gear on. <laughs> and his track is, is, is nothing. It's really very, very insignificant compared to what I'm seeing on this side. And here's my track a second ago. But I think, I mean, this is all linear across. I'm on one opposite side, you're on the opposite. And both of our tracks are Quite pale in comparison, would you agree? I would agree. Yeah. yeah. That, that something of considerable weight imprinted the vegetation there. Yeah. And I, I would I would actually extrapolate. I'm I'm thinking perhaps even at least double. I'm gonna put my foot in there. So not more than an inch larger than my foot at the very most. As I put my foot in there though, I can really feel it. Mm. I mean, there's nothing here. Mm -hmm. if, if I was closing my eyes and feeling around, I'd barely feel that. Mm -hmm. This, you got to put your foot in there. Yeah. <laughs> it, your foot just just follows falls right in there. I'd like you to do that, please. Okay. Put your foot in that track and tell me how it feels. Oh yeah, I mean, there's definitely. Like look, and now put your foot in your put your foot in your track. Yeah, there's still a lot of spring to it. I don't have it compressed it nearly as far. And it's taking it right down to the ground. Look at that, yeah. It's not rebounding. It's the PhD's job, because it's his reputation's on the line, to be uh, as skeptical as possible, but that is a Bigfoot track. I, you know, I like the, the doctor's perspective. This is what he's taught me out here, and I'm gonna say I'm 99% sure. You gotta have that little bit of doubt in your mind. And I'm, with 99% certainty, I'm saying that's a Bigfoot track. And it's not a coincidence that it's right where I've been putting apples and all the apples have been disappearing. As I guide Dr. Meldrum to this amazing habitat, I'm able to clearly perceive we are not alone. The Sasquatch that reside there are watching us. They're following us. At times, they're watching our every move, testing me over and over. Jeff may not be aware of it, but we're following very strict rules. Now on day three, Dr. Meldrum's longtime colleague is about to arrive. Dr. Bindernagel and I have never met. This expedition will be a hard one. We are about to spend five days and nights together in an enormous section of wilderness that I say is currently inhabited by a troop of large, wild, giant primates that currently are unrecognized by modern science.
My name is John Bindernagel. I'm a wildlife biologist. Uh, I live on Vancouver Island, British Columbia. I have a, a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, and a PhD from the University of Wisconsin, Madison. Right now we're in a, uh, a research site in western Alberta, not so far from Nordag. Uh, and this is a, a site to which Todd Standing has invited me to spend time with him for five days. What's been particularly interesting to me is some sign that Todd Standing interprets as Sasquatch sign, mm. which I had reservations about when I arrived, but about which I'm changing my mind. The, the most outstanding form of sign is these structures, these teepee-like, uh, this teepee-like array of leaning uh, pine sapling stems, mm. which I thought were completely random and natural. But having traveled in this country for five days now and seen no other such structures except in the area where he's observed Sasquatches, I'm now willing to conclude that these are associated with the presence of Sasquatches, which has been quite a big change for me. So what's happened since we were here yesterday? Professor. Well, we came over to look at this structure once again, and the most intriguing thing is that uh, is that we uh, placed six apples here, and they were quite scattered on these various uh, leaning branches, and even a couple here on the main stem up a ways. So the professor and I have put uh, how many apples do you see there, Doc? We had uh, five, was it? I had three. Three and I had four. Yet, four. Yet four and I had two, so we've got six in total. Up as high as both of us can reach. I'd say these apples are averaging between seven and eight feet up off the ground. Why don't you alert them? How about we say, get the, the doc to say gift in two definitive different directions, please. Okay. Nice and loud. Gift! Gift! Although the professor was unaware of it, some large predator was stalking us, and he just called out to it. Whether it was a large bear or a Sasquatch, either way, if it proceeded to take those apples, I would scour every inch of the terrain to find its trackway. You know, I was thinking to myself, it, it would be, if all of the apples get taken, scattered around as they are, that would be pretty, pretty significant. Uh, and uh, here they are, gone the next day. Completely gone. No. No sign of debris, no sign of uh, skins or cores, or no, not that they would leave cores, but scraps of the apples, I mean, uh, mm -hmm. by uh, which, which you might fi expect to find if a smaller animal had chewed on them. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they were at heights that I doubt um, an ungulate could reach. A bear would probably down that apple in, in a few bites, yeah. I think. But uh, wouldn't he, do you think he'd have to stand up against the tree? Oh, sure. Uh, and, and but uh, yeah, a bear would have no problem. I'm trying to remember. Uh, as high as we could reach, we put up these apples. Up here, you know, that you might expect to see some evidence of claw marks if it was a bear. I would think the bear would shinny up uh, to grab those apples. There was absolutely no signs of any bear. This is what Jeff had to say when interviewed a few weeks later on the topic. It was as if something with hands had collected them off and carried them away. So while Jeff further discussed the structure with John, I went to work. Something had taken those apples, and I knew what it was, but I needed proof. Something profound. And then I found it. So again, what do you, th what do you think of this trackway that you're seeing? Well, there are certainly some impressions in the moss here that could well be uh, Sasquatch tracks, the mm -hmm. pair here, and then mm -hmm two, three additional tracks as mm -hmm. if it had stood here and walked ahead. And what direction are they moving? Good question. Looks like they're moving exactly towards where the apples were. Uh, yeah, I can't really tell. Well, I'm seeing, in this one, I'm seeing a heel and I'm seeing actual, see the toe marks in there? So I'm seeing a bit see. of toe marks mm -hmm. and a definitive heel mark. mark. So, so if you just come over this way, we didn't walk anywhere over here and I'm seeing so we haven't walked past this log. So I'm seeing this impression yeah. that moves to that impression, that moves to the next impression over there. Not so the one right there. And that oh, so maybe. so look and look at the size approximately. Yeah. So this is a little larger. Right there. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, uh, possible. 
you know, and, and actually you can you can see them from here. This is a really good one over here. Actually, it looks like he stopped and stood here. So the steps are here and here. Maybe stopped and had a look, and then from the here, the next track is there. This is mine. That's where I, I whoa, I stopped and said, wait a second. That's uh, it's very interesting. Did I point there or did I point there? Both. There. Yeah, both of them. Well, and, and if you're looking, they're really in line. Yeah. They're really straight. Right. Yeah, you can kind of see a progression. Is it with the pine needles in it? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the other one where that, where that stick is, com that little short stick's stick coming up at an angle right yeah, there. Yeah. Right at the base of it. Looks almost from here in a way. It looks like that could be, an could be another one. I agree. It's so hard to it is. judge in this. Well, and, and now and now the moss is growing back. Right. Uh, you know, assuming this happened, this had to have happened in the last 20 hours. Yeah. So now the moss is going to be growing back and recovering. But what, if you were to step in these, which you will in a second, you'll feel indentations. You'll feel the unusual pressure that it would have taken to do that. Yeah. But the fact that apples are missing and there's this trackway mm -hmm. that we'll have a look at. So are you okay with that? Sure, to, yeah, to step can, in there? Yeah. Yeah. Please do. So give it a okay. step right precisely in where the spots are. So here's a, a, some uh, potential footprints of a plantigrade. I mean, they're quite impressive. Uh, you know, my foot fits right there, and, and then it's possible that it stopped right there like that. That's what it's looking like. And we're, we're assuming the next step is looking here. Right. So perhaps... So, and that would be, well, it could be either. Let's, I, I believe that looks to me like it's a uh, right foot. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. That's kind of a, a reach for me. Let's let's give it a go. Well, I was going to say it almost looks like there's another right here. There's a little bit of compression right there. Yeah, possibly. So it could have been. Let me just feel it. Yeah, it's pretty solid underneath it. Okay. But that could have been. But okay. in any case, then here's a the right foot, which really compressed nicely. Yeah, and then appears a left foot yeah. right there, and you can see where it's it's crushed the underlying. Uh, that's right, it has it. So that's definitely a print of some kind. Yeah, agreed. And then another one right here, you can see where it's tore. It's torn the uh, muskeg at the, at the lead end of it. And, and then from there, it's hard to say. It's pretty jumbled how about, there. How about we just take a leap of faith to see where that next foot goes? Yeah, well, I would plant it. If I was going that way, I'd plant it right there. <laughs> Maybe. And that's really getting undefinitive now. Yeah, We're really losing is. the trackway. The ground's but, getting much harder. Yeah, there's yeah, yeah there's less less uh, springing into the muskeg at this point. And I, I don't see any definitive. Agreed, but the, again, the ground's getting hard and now right. we can start walking on the right. the trees. So, so short. You know, it's, it's very suggestive. The placement of the feet uh, is uh, suggestive of a biped. Interesting trajectory, interesting uh, association with, uh, with the bait or the gifts that we left out mm -hmm. just yesterday. And I have a tradition, uh, Professor Meldrum, that when I have this kind of success, it makes me happy. Yeah. We, do, we do this, we give a high five, sir. High five. So <laughs> it's, it's a step in the right direction, right? So um, it's a real step in the right direction. I'm, yeah. I'm not afraid to get excited. Well, of course, the thing that, that most uh, piqued my interest and curiosity and motivated me to come and spend this time with Todd was, uh, was the uh, extraordinary videos. I still am very interested to learn more and see more uh, relating to these extraordinary videos. Because if indeed they are, they are clearly some of the most astounding photos of, uh, of Sasquatch in existence. And so uh, I'm, uh, while, while this has been a fascinating visit and I've been uh, uh, immensely impressed. I've been able to see for the first time uh, some complete segments of Todd Standing's filming of Sasquatch in another, in another area where he's worked on and with him explaining the background, which is so important. And uh, I'm firmly convinced that he has filmed Sasquatches and that he has what he has portrayed in his documentaries are indeed very close portraits, in fact, of the Sasquatch face.
For the video, I zoomed in 20 times optical and obviously had no tripod. I remained in this position for at least 20 minutes while the animal you see in video four moved from one position to the next. I was situated over 50 yards away and downhill from his position. I was hiding beneath a large pine tree and covered by my ghillie suit. The snow was melting, so I was having to switch back and forth from video camera to still camera as water would drop down onto the lenses. He would regularly disappear from my line of sight as I'm sure he was searching for me in a direction of about 180 degrees. This animal certainly knew I was around, but I suspect that he had no idea how close I actually was. What they were doing, it was, it was amazing how they had this spectacularly implemented plan to ensure that I didn't get into the spot I wanted. Um, the day watcher had discovered me and uh, I became aware of it. Moments later, he disappeared and I knew at that point that uh, he'd alerted the main group. And I expected that as a, in the past, these animals would simply move away. This group is entirely different from the previous group I was studying Sylvanic. Previously, they would become aware of us, they would simply move away and really have virtually no interaction with us after that. This species, I would say based on where they are, because the region that they uh, inhabit is overlooking an area where hunters hunt and kill. They see men with guns all the time from their high points up in the mountains. They stand their ground. These guys don't back away, they don't run away. They stand their ground and uh, they push me out. This has been a big reality check for me. Like I said earlier, in the previous expedition that I was on uh, last year in August when I was tremendously successful, I lost my video camera because they actually threw stones and logs and branches at me to the point where it injured me. For the next three days as I returned to base camp, this group of Sasquatch harassed me relentlessly. After sleeping less than 30 minutes, I was awakened by rocks that were thrown at me and growling sounds from multiple directions. Fuck. After two nights of this, I'd had enough, so you'll see me here crack open one of my big flares. These growling sounds you hear are from six to 10 yards away, again in multiple directions. Now you can hear rocks thrown at me and various animals closing in on me from multiple positions. Here you can hear a large male walk within four yards of me and after my screaming and shouting, Fuck. walk the other way. where we are attempting to conduct a study of the species commonly referred to as Bigfoot. My team and I have been on over 30 expeditions into this region, and two by me have yielded significant close proximity contact with these animals. For this October 2010 expedition, although there certainly were significant dangers, including the grizzly bear confrontation, I suffered only minor injuries. So before I get into detail of the expedition itself, I'd like to thank Radium Police, as well as Kimberly and Invermere Search and Rescue. This region of the Rocky Mountains is certainly some of the most dangerous backcountry in the continent. Very few people ever use these trails, and a high percentage that do disappear or are killed. This area between Kootenai and Banff National Parks is where wildlife officers relocate bears and mountain lions that have become dangerous to people. So here are these spring 2011 photographs. I'll start out with this one. Uh, a photograph I'm still very proud of, but obviously doesn't show a whole lot. And if it was all that I got, it would have never been proven as Bigfoot. Here's 
one of the photographs. This looks like an artist's drawing, but it's not. It's actually a photograph. I just had to crank up the contrast and brightness and saturation so you could have a good look and see his eyes and his nose and his fur and everything that's, that's there. And you'll obviously see it's the same animal as, as this guy is. He's a day watcher. This one, there was some sun coming through the trees and you can see that how it's sort of lit up the front of his face. Now we'll go into the videos, and the videos are all again of this same exact day watcher. So we start out with this one, all we'll be able to see here is an eyeball. Actually his whole body's there, his shoulders, everything. You can see his eye right there in the middle of the screen. I'll highlight that for you again in a second. But uh, there it is, it's highlighted so you can see his eye, and if you actually watch in the previous one a little bit, you can see it blink as well. Now uh, obviously this one and the video to follow, this one we're watching right here where he's in the bottom right hand side, really not significant evidence at all. This illustrates actually, if anything else, how much of a difficult time I was having getting my focus. I'm trying to focus through, you know, a half a dozen trees and branches and uh, again, if this is all the evidence that I had, it really wouldn't have been worth anything. Um, you can barely see him moving there. Uh, at this point, obviously, you could even argue that was probably a bear. You can see dark fur and, and the lighter color in his face. On this one, it's getting pretty definitive. You can really see a nose and lips on the bottom left-hand side. You can see a little bit of movement out of him. And uh, just amazing to me how well camouflaged his whole body and, and all of him was. This is the one that was released to media. When I released this video still to the media, I gave them a blurry one. I gave them about, the, the video still I gave them was right about here. And as you can see here, crystal clear. You can even see an insect fly up off of him. So a really clear shot. This one I had to really crank up on the, uh, the brightness and the uh, saturation. There's an eye blink for you. But uh, again, the same animal as you're seeing in all these videos. I will slow it down a little bit for those of you who missed the eye blink. You can see his head moving there really slowly as well. But uh, again, I'll slow down for the eye blink for those of you who missed it. In the last hour of Professor Meljum's three days and three nights stay with me in the field, he experienced an entire Sasquatch encounter that ended with the professor having a significant sighting of a Sasquatch. He was forced to leave early the next morning due to scheduling conflicts. Four weeks later, with no further discussion on the incident, I went to visit the professor at his office in Idaho State University to document his eyewitness accounting and, for the first time, show the professor what I had discovered the following morning in his absence. Okay, now this is a big yeah, deal. Yeah. So we gotta pay close attention to this. So this is you, I have the camera, mm -hmm. standing from approximately where you had seen something right. that you're not quite sure about and you have your night vision and right. the infrared spotlight and you're shining it around that there's no audio here you'll see in a minute that you have the night vision spotlight that you remember mm -hmm. and you're looking you're saying you know it went off in this direction off in this direction uh, that if it's still around it would be in in this area this is where you're looking and then now you're saying this is where it came from approximately mm -hmm. so it, it moved in this direction and you're so you're shining the spotlight so I'm just trying to get a mm -hmm. An idea. Really have a good look. There's the trees. This right. is this is that bit of a hill. Notice how the grass is in the way. I remember right. you said too that you didn't see the whole body. It was very obscured, exactly. right? Exactly. Yeah. The, so, and the grass on the berm was catching the firelight glow. Mm. So through my night vision, that was quite illuminated. Oh wow! That is a, and, something I never even thought of. And so when it, the, this you know shadowy figure, sort of forward leaning, was was right behind that grass. And that makes perfect sense because that 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 grass would have been almost bleached from the infrared yep. light from the fire. Right. And what you're seeing was beyond that. And that's and yeah. That really so was, makes sense. So it was quite the contrast was quite dramatic, and and mm -hmm. so the figure behind without the illumination, because obviously when I saw the figure, I didn't have that spotlight, spotlight in yeah. hand. Uh, it was just it was just a very shadowy, ambiguous figure, but it was, mm -hmm. you know, just hunched over mm -hmm. and moving very, very smoothly. Yes, so now this is, this I haven't, this is still a camera. Now this is you really quickly giving a demonstration of what you saw. That's all you're gonna do. Uh -huh. So did you okay. want to see that again? Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, I'm gonna run that one more time. And you're really excited. You're really talking a lot because you may have just seen a Sasquatch, so really mm -hmm. so. But so now I pan down and now I go to you and this is you do your walk. Yeah. And immediately I, I thought, wow, that looks a lot like a hunched over large Patterson kind of sure, creature yeah, walk. Yeah, yeah, that was the... So, and that's, that's the only time you do it, you won't mm -hmm. do it again. But, I mean, you walk like, I've seen Sasquatch walk. Sure. Similar to. Yeah. Now you're talking about where you'd seen it. Uh-huh. The direction that you'd gone, that you'd seen it move. Uh-huh. Now what do you recall about the way that it moved? Well, I, I was impressed by two things. One was the forward lean, 
and the second thing was the lack of any bobbing. Mm -hmm. It was just extremely smooth and uh, not rapid, but but quick, a quick movement, mm -hmm. which suggested to me a compliant gait, you know, mm -hmm. flexed, flexed limbs like I was trying to emulate there. It came from the general vicinity of where um, Sonia was interacting with something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There were brush pops and snaps in the darkness. That's right, yes. So there was something there, and then she returned to her seat. I was uh, scanning with the night vision in that direction, mm -hmm. and that's when I saw this thing move across my field of view. I thought, you know, I, I really wanted you all, knowing that I was going to leave before daylight the next morning, mm -hmm. I wanted you all to really scrutinize the ground along that creek bed to see if there was any evidence. Of Absolutely. It's interesting to me, uh, your, your, I, I really appreciate your skepticism because I was even closer. And I'm glad you heard the, the rustling and the wood pops. After all the sound that we made, as just being human beings out there, all the sounds that we'd made, us moving in that direction, you, you, you just alluded to there was something out there. I'm not gonna beat around the bush. I know that was a Sasquatch that mm. was out there. Nothing else would do that. But I do appreciate your skepticism sure. on that. I found a definitive trackway that I am as certain of as the trackway that you walked in earlier mm. that oh. next day. Mm -hmm. it, uh, you don't see it, the, the, the deep impressions in the moss, but the grass is very, very clearly compressed in a 13 inch. And I, I cut these pieces to match the length of the track uh, exactly. Mm -hmm. And there were a couple other things. The motion, I would say with 100% certainty, the grass, as the foot was coming down, there's two things that are happening here. There's a hill yeah. and there's movement in that direction. Mm -hmm. So as he was stepping, the grass is bent and pushed in that fashion. Does that make sense? As sure. The foot's coming from the right and pushing to the left. Yeah. And the tracks are about a meter and a half, and then a half a meter, and then a meter and a half. Hmm. And the reason for that is, I believe he was staying low, he kept his body turned away from you just a little bit, because his eyes can light, hmm. and, and he was bending in the knees just a little bit. And you'll see me move the trackway the way I have to walk it to match it. Hmm. You have to move in a very specific way when you're moving across a hill. So look, see how my feet are pointed up? Mm -hmm. So I'm matching the track exactly. So my feet aren't straight like this. If my feet are straight, I'm turning over like this. Sure. So the right. tracks that I'm seeing are pointed like this, just a bit. Now watch me do the trackway. Watch the way my feet will move. There. See that cross? Mm -hmm. Now see, I'm not bending yeah. or bumping at all, but there is the cross. To do that cross, you'll see in the trackway that I'm finding yeah. there, it's longer, shorter. Yeah. So I'm looking at a 13 inch track from mm. Sasquatch that moved exactly the way you just saw my feet move. Hmm. These are very, very deep, noticeable impressions in the grass. You saw this grass, so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it really took a lot. And, and I would say John was certainly relying on my ability to, to see tracks. Um, he looked at it and said, well, it looks like there could be something there. This is the view of the campsite. Oh, well, yeah, that's quite some distance. It looks far, but remember in the, in the video we just saw a minute ago, this is, I'm on that hill that looked really close that you were shining the light on. Yeah. And you'll see John walk on that hill. Now. Oh, yeah. That's, that's where the track that's it. Oh my goodness, that's it though. Yeah, because it was, th this grass was very illuminated. Mm -hmm. And, and the figure I see, I, I would have, I would guess the figure would be at least half again as tall as John. Mm -hmm. You can clearly see, you only had the view of about this much of the hill. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Well, yeah, I just, I mean, I, I remember it's, I, I, I picked it up right about here, it seems, and then lost it because there, there was a shadow cast across this part yeah. here. Yeah, that would, that would pretty much account for it. That certainly would. How do you feel now having seen this about? Well, it, cer it certainly, uh, further substantiates the uh, the impression of what i saw yeah that and and it's interesting how how well that lined up um you know and and the fact that the the sign that you cut there correlates or corresponds to the apparent path of what i remember seeing of a sasquatch moving very fluidly very smooth well and and the other thing that strikes me too is had i uh given you instructions or given you my uh, my inclination as to where to look. I was going to concentrate down on the muddy parts mm -hmm. of the creek bank, <coughs> but um, but from your reconstruction here, it's rather clear to me that those would not have been in the appropriate place. No way. But seeing it now from this vantage point, that's exactly that's exactly it. Mm -hmm. I mean, because I I remember it emerging from the the spot of these trees, mm -hmm. a shadowy figure anyway. 
and then losing it just right there. Yeah. And had you been down on the creek, it would you would have been invisible. And it's exactly as you said, mm -hmm. top to bottom. Hmm. Wow. So oh, that's interesting. I, I that's have exciting. news for you, Professor. I have with 100% certainty. I know that you saw a Sasquatch that day. There's no way. I would, f I would have never even looked for that trackway had you not have seen something. Mm -hmm. And I scoured this area top to bottom, obviously every millimeter, to find that very difficult to see trackway. Mm -hmm. And after I'd analyzed it and looked at it, I was 100% certain that there was a trackway through there th with, from a being that I had not seen, but you had. Right. You did not see some obscure Sasquatch-like <laughs> creature that looked like maybe a Sasquatch. It was blurring. It was not. You uh -huh. definitively saw a Sasquatch, the Sasquatch that I heard. Well, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm quite, like I said, very, very excited uh, and quite intrigued at the prospects. I mean, you say you're 100% convinced. Mm -hmm. I'm, I would say I can draw uh, an inference that I'm quite confident in based on the corroboration. I think the I think that uh, there was a certain degree of independence going on here in the analysis <clears throat> that may have been for, uh, fortuitous. But then to see you come to the conclusion that there was a trackway when laid, and when that trackway was laid out, uh, it lined up so perfectly with what I thought I had seen. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's far beyond coincidence. Far, that's far, far, <laughs> far, far beyond. So, so congratulations. Well, very yeah, happy. 20, yeah. Well, it's still not, years. that's still not the, the it's sighting the that I, yeah, it's the beginning. It's the beginning. After the expedition, I returned to the location of Dr. Meldrum's sighting. This is an aerial view taken from the professor's approximate position. I found the Sasquatch, the doctor I witnessed, moved along this trackway. He moved past the apples, live interacted with us via foot stomping and breaking branches, then proceeded to cross the open pathway where the professor eyewitnessed him. The apples were taken, but not by him. Where did the apples go? And why did he cross the pathway into open view? This answer becomes more obvious when you see he was not alone. The 13 inch track that had taken the apples on the previous day, whom I believe is a female, circled around the base camp as did the 14 inch Sasquatch. But it was her who once again took the apples based on the trackway I observed. However, she exited in the same way she came into the apples area, then exited the area the same way the 14 inch track did. The entire incident was initially cued by an odd chirping sound. I believe that chirp was initiated here by young Sasquatch, whom had a nine inch track, followed by a large 700 plus pound male with a 15.5 inch track. It would seem clear now, the 14 inch male crossed the open path to regroup with these two individuals and exit the area together. I must say that uh, sitting and watching these videos, especially that video of the, the, the devil, as you refer to him, the dark faced uh, individual, I can't look at that image and not feel that I'm looking into the eyes of a living creature. And, uh, and yeah, that's very exciting. I mean, that's, as, as I said, it, uh, I've often imagined what it would feel like to actually gaze into the face of a Sasquatch eventually. And uh, I must say that that experience of, of watching that film on the laptop was as close to that experience, I think, as, as I've had. We can get you out there and in three days in a good research site, get you that kind of success. Can you imagine what's going to happen after three months? Sure. Or three years? Well, Can you imagine yeah, yeah. spending three years and why not? Is it not important enough to spend oh, three so, years on? Yeah. Absolutely. Well, what a place to spend it too. I mean, that's amazing. Absolutely. And, and, and that's, and I have bad news for you. That was my bad research site. Yes. I the know. good news is my good research site <laughs> is significantly more productive than that research is by 10 times. The group in that research site come all around me. They, they take things more readily from me. Approximately 45 minutes ago, I was in the tent and I heard a pop, this sound, while I was putting some of my equipment together. I froze and waited about 10 seconds, and again, pop, in precisely the same spot that that Sasquatch revealed its location in the form of chirps a day ago for Professor Meldrum, an hour before he had his potential sighting, and the whole while where there was crashing. So we still have two days left, 
So today, we're going to focus on seeing if we can find tracks in the area Dr. Meldrum and I heard the Sasquatch approaching from. So we're just having a look at uh, another track. Base camp is right that direction. So we're up the road a bit. I found this by seeing another one down, a partial, and then noticing this right here, this broken piece of moss. It looks like this is left foot, right foot. This is the piece of significance. It's right here, there's the pencil. Similar, Sorry. very odd that it's so similar to the one that uh, Jeff found. Mm -hmm. The brakes on the edge, the clear pressure that was put there. And that, and that toe underneath a piece of wood. Yeah, yeah. it's the same as that. It keep happening. Okay, so uh, Dr. Bender Nagel is going to slam his foot into the ground as hard as he can. Look at that. Indiscer almost unnoticeable with all his weight, comparatively speaking to this. Now, Doctor, I'd like you to put your foot, your, your right foot, in the Bigfoot track. The right That's, one? Yeah. You don't want to press down. Oh, no, sorry, left foot. Let's do left foot. Yeah, press yeah. down it. Press down it, please. Yeah? Okay. Just, I want you to feel, feel that breakage. Yeah. Now put, now put your foot in your, in your other track. Right. See the difference? Yeah. What's the difference that you felt? Well, that one's already compressed. Significantly, and you could really feel yes. like it's been pushed and, down. It doesn't spring back like this. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Say, same, same about, the foot's about the same size as yours. Same length. Uh -huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about weight? I mean, the weight quite a bit wider, especially across the uh -huh. ball of the foot. Mm -hmm. But even, even, how even the heel. How much weight would have had to go into that to crush that? Yeah, I have no idea. I mean, even you. Obviously, it's significantly more than yours. Significantly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Yes. Yes. Yes, and, and a very sharp edge trap track. Mm -hmm. That's what uh, I find quite interesting. One thing that's been particularly interesting for me is are these tree snaps, where conifer saplings are snapped off at between oh, 8 foot and 12 foot, and which Todd Standing interprets as big Sasquatch sign. I thought these were random and natural, until I came to realize, again, as we traveled round about, I've not seen many of these at all, and I've seen them only in areas where he's recorded Sasquatch activity. This is the first tree break I've seen on this trail. This, and this is, looks to be the right height. If I could get uh, the doctor sure. to stand beside sure. it, please. Sure. Oops. So, and now, it, just very interesting. I'll, talk, I'll discuss with the doctor why I feel this is appropriate off camera, but uh, the right height, as we've seen on a couple others, you know. Pretty uh, consistent, 6 yeah. 14 feet, yeah. Yeah, so. Uh, very interesting, and the only one we've seen, I've seen no others, I would identify it as, as a tree break from a, a larger Sasquatch. So as I was just leaving, about to have lunch, uh, right within my line of sight, approximately 20 yards from where I'm standing, or 20 yards from where I'm standing is the other tree break that we just saw. Here's one much larger that we just found, much, much larger. Again, pointing in the same, and you can see the, the break over there, they're in the same direction. So, I get, but most importantly, pointed towards the road. But this one is enormous, just absolutely enormous. If you could st stand beside it, please, doctor, just to give that okay. size okay. comparison again. Yep. <laughs> absolutely enormous. Right. Look at that. Quite tall. Huge. So, if that was broken by <laughs> a primate, that was very, very impressive power. Mm -hmm. And look at look how clean the break is too. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would I would even deduce by that break, it was just tremendous force it took to snap that. I mean, it's clean. 
snap. The only reason we even saw this one is I saw the, the first one and walked a little over and here we go. Mm -hmm. And the age again, looks quite similar. Mm -hmm. So what do you think, sir? Oh, it looks, it looks very similar to the last one. Mm -hmm. uh, larger diameter sapling, broken further up. Just interesting. Very interesting, very yeah. interesting, very intriguing. So I'm also coming to the conclusion that these indeed may be associated with uh, the presence of Sasquatches. You know what's great about this one? Is the trees all around it, undamaged. I can see one, two, three, four, five, six trees, all about the same diameter or smaller that are untouched, undamaged, unbro unbroken. And let's see, I'm not a slouch of a guy. I'm a little stronger than average kind of human being. Let's see if Todd's standing can even come close to breaking. If this tree has a three inch diameter, this one has a two inch diameter. And I'm gonna give it my all. Hopefully I don't look too ridiculous. I'm gonna tell you that I didn't even bend it. I wasn't even close. I had, there was not even, you would need five times my power to break this tree two inches in diameter and this one three inches in diameter. Even look at reaching it. To do this, you need to put one hand here and I've seen a Sasquatch do this, so I'm telling you. He puts one hand here and he pulls down and breaks with that kind of power. Or if it's a small tree break, they're so powerful, It'll just come from the wrist. He can actually take this and twist his wrist and break it. That is obscene, ridiculous power. So when I sleep at night and I hear large primates coming around me at night, my apples get taken and there's tracks left the next day. And that happens the night after. I'm very aware that the species that's capable of this immense, ridiculous, completely stunning, impressive power they're bigger than twice the gorilla, maybe stronger than twice the gorilla. You better be afraid. Because if you're not, you have my sympathy. I'm also interested to see that when they do break naturally, they tend to break near the ground or where they're very weak, very high up, not predictably at the eight to 12 foot level. So we've just come to this spot I just wanted to make a point of uh, what I see is very natural here. This is a, a natural break. Looks very natural. And it looks also to me extremely different from what I see with the Sasquatch breaks. Those are much more definitive and outstanding. And this is just clearly a regular break. Now, uh, Dr. Brendan Hagel, so now would you agree with me in saying this looks very different from what we've seen? Yes. Yes, I would say that the break, the break is not right through. It's not a discreet break. And would you say every other break that I've shown you was very discreet and very obvious, maybe in your own words? They were certainly different from this. They were more discreet, usually higher. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and so you agree with me, this looks very natural, very... I think this is a natural occurrence, yes. Excellent. Last night, the bird chirping uh, sounds that the Sasquatch had been making for me uh, regularly, the bird chirping sounds that Professor Meldrum heard uh, before we heard some stomping around in the woods and then Professor Meldrum had his, what he thinks may have very well been his Sasquatch sighting, his, his first ever, were, were done last night. These night bird calls were heard several times. Uh, my hearing's not very good at all, so I only heard it once when it was quite close. Jeff Meldrum, when he, when he was here, heard it several times, and Todd heard it several times, so it, it seems to be occurring around, uh, around the campsite area. They moved on both sides of the road towards us slowly. Unfortunately, because Dr. Bender uh, is has hearing aids and has difficulty hearing, especially high-pitched sounds, he never heard them until they were very, very close to us. At about 1 a.m., at least three Sasquatch moved in on John and myself. I could hear one move in from the north as two more approached from the south. 
Every few minutes, I could hear a gently whistled chirp and branches snapping. Then the sounds from the south became much more pronounced. I could hear dry trees snapping as this Sasquatch slowly approached from the south, but John could hear nothing. Until I could hear the Sasquatch was less than 30 yards away. I pleaded with John to listen intently, directly south of our position where I could hear the Sasquatch right up on the hill. Thankfully, within a minute, the Sasquatch let out what I would describe as a booming chirp combined with a deep stomp. John heard that very clearly. Todd is able to uh, imitate this sound uh, very well, mm. and, and I've heard his imitation of it, which very closely approximates the call I heard. You'll do that sound, eh? Mm. Uh, yeah. Yeah. They would stomp around and they would let us know that they were there, and they would, you know, the wood, wood breaking would happen when they would be stomping, and uh, large primate sounding bipedal movement along with the chirps. I have to. I know that that's a Sasquatch and that's all there is to it. I'll be very interested to, to know if in fact, this is in fact a, a night bird call or a Sasquatch mimicking uh, a night bird call. And it was a very significant uh, night last night. So today we're going to focus on seeing if we can find tracks where those bird chirps were heard. I'm out here with Dr. Bendernago, and uh, the problem that I face is uh, after 20 years of, of tracking and, and, and studying trails, uh, I am seeing fresh tracks, but nothing that would be significant to, to anybody else other than a, a very experienced tracker. For example, here is, here's the indentation of a wide track that was pushed down on. But what was interesting and what cued me to this track was this. This is very raw and it hasn't rained out here in at least the, 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 the six days I've been out here. So this moisture, the way it's offset, tells me this up until yesterday was really Indent, indented into the, the ground. You can see by this darker spot and these dry spots and compressed up. And I found this as far away as that. So to a tracker, extremely significant evidence. It fits right back in there perfectly. And this compression is very wide at the bottom and wide all the way to the top. Um, like anything else, superficial evidence like that is just not a great indicator and uh, we need a profound ridiculous amazing track like we've seen two on this expedition that were really profound but in this moss you're never going to anything that's really castable to the point of dermal ridges and, and and tissue scarring at the bottom of the foot which is the evidence we need here i hope you can appreciate even this little mark Here again we are really uh, at the approximate point where uh, we heard that sound and I've seen a lot of really good indicators. This was found like that. This end was broken off of this. And if we follow this down just a little bit, we'll see this freshly broken. So. Lots of indications of uh, something having moved right into this direction where the alleged bird chirp was heard. So, very interesting. So I just found this track, um, very small. What would you approximate it to be in length, John? I don't know. Is it nine inches? Yeah. Maybe? Yeah, I think nine inches. Um, I'm seeing a lot of weight in the way the, the wood's damaged on this side. It's, it's fairly fresh. 
I'm not seeing any rebounding in the moss. I'm just going to say there's also just a single trunk. Yeah. Well, you know, this is this is easy to climb on. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. And so was this. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't leave a mark on that if you were right. moving on that. I can see that the track is going, the track is moving in this direction. Wow. What do you say about that? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know either. That's really confusing. <laughs> it mildly looks like a Sasquatch track. I mean, I could, I could, I could say toes, but this is a foot. Mm -hmm. A shoe doesn't do this. If you look at my shoe, they almost always have this, this culmination like this, and, and even uh, often a, an archway. Can I see your shoes at the bottom? Mm -hmm. See how shoes generally have an archway like this, and a broader front mm -hmm. that, that's that's not linear. I'm seeing perfect linearity in this, mm -hmm. like a, like actual raw human foot. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also see. A, weight here this is really and a, a barefoot skin that would be damaging mm -hmm. do you know what i mean mm -hmm. like, and if you feel that john mm -hmm. have, a, have a feel that's not gentle wood no that quite, doesn't break easy quite firm mm -hmm. it's very very firm i'll do a demonstration right beside it as close as i can without damaging the track of to just to see what i can do with my weight so push with my shoe i didn't do any damage mm -hmm. to the side of the tree even with my nails if i dig on it it's just not doing that kind of damage. What can be immediately discerned with 100% certainty about this track is this individual was facing the camp and the track is of a right foot. It's nine inches long, which is a size six shoe for the foot of an average 12 year old male human. On the inside of the foot was where the immense pressure was applied that crushed the wood. On the inside of any human's foot is the archway. Not only did this man-like track have no archway, but the inside of its foot was flat and extremely powerful. Precisely fitting the description of hundreds of Sasquatch tracks I have witnessed, as well as thousands of others reported by individuals across Canada and the United States. After my analysis, I must conclude no known species could have made this track. This is a young Sasquatch foot stomp and we found it in the approximate area John and I heard the chirp less than 14 hours previously. Furthermore, this is not a track as part of a trackway. No other obvious tracks were found along this creature's trajectory. The pathway was only discovered by the broken trees that I personally heard as the Sasquatch approached. This is an incredibly powerful foot stomp, and it was clearly done deliberately. I believe it was done simultaneously with the chirp sound, which would account for the deep crashing sound I perceived in conjunction with the bird-like chirp sound Dr. Bernanagel and myself observed. At the end of this year's research in Nordegg, we're able to confirm two individuals via eyewitness sightings and tracks, as well as three other individuals via live interactions confirmed by tracks. Based on this information, there were five or more individuals in this group. They're here, they know about us, they're aware of us, they think that they're communicating with us, and we're just not getting it. And that's why I'm trying to get species protection and recognition and trying to get primatologists to stop going all the bloody way to Africa when you have bipedal, man-like primates currently residing right here on the continent of North America. Time to take our heads out of the sand and recognize this incredible primate species and start learning from them because the masters of civilization, my people, sure could learn a lot from the masters of the wilderness, which is who they are. There's no way that you got sight of a Sasquatch in those areas, with those tree breaks, with those tracks, getting those apples taken, with those sounds, all these things.
check it out. But right now, there's a Sasquatch moving back behind me, nice and slow. He's letting me know he's there, though. He doesn't have to do that. This whole boom, 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 boom. It's intimidation, and it should work. I'm being followed by, you know, probably a 700 pound primate is chasing me. I wonder if the bugs are getting him too. When returning from my Sasquatch expeditions to base camp, most of the time, at least two individuals follow me out of the habitat. Right now, you can hear a squirrel off in the distance. He is not squawking at me. Foraging for food this way in open areas is a behavior I learned from primatologists like Diane Fossey. The goal is to show these primates a behavior they recognize as calm. The more they relax in my presence, the closer they get to me. And these particular individuals are very, very close. For years, I've always exited this habitat the exact same way. They expect me to follow the same path and the same speed, and that's exactly what I've been doing. All the while waiting for that cue to one day turn around with the hope of getting closer. Fortunately for me, this day, I heard that cue. It was a call out like nothing I'd ever heard before. And it happened at the perfect time, in the perfect place. I quickly moved into position. There's a blind spot up there I jumped into and waited. It seemed to be working. I could hear them approaching very closely. I panned around with my 50 times optical zoom camera and could hear this individual was very close, but I could see nothing. Several minutes passed with no success. So in an act of desperation, I turned on my thermal camera. Fortunately, the conditions were perfect. Within seconds, I could see something. And there it was. An image so shocking to me, I instinctively took two steps back. Clearly, less than 60 yards away from me was a very large heat signature. This signature was about 20 yards up a pine tree that had no branches. Only a black bear or a young grizzly could elicit this behavior. Certainly no human being could do this. Here, any possibility of this image being any known species is gone from my mind. This Sasquatch is holding itself up at times with one arm. He in fact looks very comfortable as he's waiting for me to emerge from the bottom of the mountain. Shocked by what I'm witnessing, I quietly reposition myself. After nearly a decade of work, this is the first time I've ever filmed a Sasquatch thermally or in a tree. I momentarily film my hand temperature as a heat reference. At this point, this primate becomes aware of where I'm actually located as the other Sasquatch begins to protest to my far right. Now, as I move to reposition, my goal becomes filming this individual in motion on the ground. I did not succeed in this endeavor. But now, for the first time ever, I was moving backwards towards these primates. I call this troop of Sasquatch the Wild Bunch because they do not back away from me. And as I suspected, they did in fact stand their ground. With my last bit of battery power in my camera, I was able to film these incredible images in full HD at 50 times optical zoom. At this point, I had to reach for my other burnt out battery in the hope I could get at least a few more seconds of filming.
it worked. The Sasquatch you see was in the shadow of this tree root and barely visible to the naked eye. But thanks to the high sensitivity sensor on this camera, the images I was able to record were very impressive. This Sasquatch is looking down at me, likely shocked by this odd behavior I'm exhibiting. Once this last battery was spent, there was nothing else I could use to record with. Although the events that transpired between myself and these two primates over the next few hours were significant, there could be no video or audio record of any kind. I can't even imagine what they think of us. You know, we are a really advanced species, considered to be the most advanced species on the planet. But the Sasquatch are aware of us. They interact with me. They do things to communicate with us. Most people don't get it. Knowing that they're aware of us, and we're supposed to be the dominant species on this planet, and we're not aware of them. Who's the intelligent one? Have we gone so far from the wilderness, from the wild, from nature, that we can't realize that the masters of the wilderness, which is what Sasquatch are, there's no arguing that. Anybody who's going to realize this species exists in today's day and age has to admit, you have to admit, that they are a very, very advanced race of hominids, exceptional. They live and they thrive in this ecosystem. What's it gonna take for human beings to understand that the most man-like primate is currently alive in the forests of North America. We may not acknowledge it yet, but if I have anything to say about it, it's gonna change real soon.